Today I'm speaking with Mr. Elijah Woody, a 17-year-old conservative activist from Franklin County, Virginia. We're going to be discussing several different topics, including but not limited to Gen Z's involvement in politics in America. Without further ado, let's get into it. America is no longer one nation under God. Are you ready to fight for a revival? Well, then you've come to the right place. Welcome to Fighting Revive Without a Boy. Okay, folks, as promised, joining me now, live from Franklin County, Virginia, is the conservative activist, uh, rising star in the Republican Party, some would say, and that'd be Mr. Elijah Woody, student here at Liberty University, just in my backyard here in Campbell County. So, Elijah, thank you for coming on the show. Always a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much, Adam. I'm uh, very excited to be here. Absolutely excited to have you on. Glad we were able to get this set up. So, just kind of as an, as a, an icebreaker and just to get things going here, uh, just tell the, give the uh, viewer, the listener, a little bit of background about yourself, uh, how you got involved in politics, what you're doing in politics right now. Um, I'll let you have, have the floor for a couple minutes. Yeah, so my name is Elijah Woody. I'm 17 years old. I'm the oldest of eight children. Uh, right now, I'm going into my senior year of high school, but I, all my classes are college classes through Liberty University, so I'll graduate high school with an associate's degree. I first got involved in politics and became interested when I was nine, and that was in 2016. So the presidential election rolled around. It was, you know, a very interesting one, very interesting year. And one of my first, you know, political memories was staying up on election night that night, uh, nine years old, very interested. And that, you know, just really sparked uh, a fire in me, a passion that's only grown stronger. And I know that now in the future, I want to be a public servant leader in some way, shape or form, uh, you know, run for political office, maybe at some point. But ultimately, I don't want to focus on that. I want to focus on, you know, the cause of freedom, liberty um, and, and really preserving this amazing nation that we have and the foundation that I think we should build from and try to continue, you know, the American legacy for our future posterity, just as our founders did in the 1700s. So in your opinion, and this one's not in our notes, but just kind of capitalizing off what you said there. What is the, how do I put it? What is the main, I, the questions kind of go hand in hand. The main problem slash the main solution for America right now. What, what are we facing that really needs to be turned around? Is it, in your view, view, is it more of a political thing, a, a governmental thing, a spiritual thing? or what, what, are you, what do you think about that? So that's a really good question because you have to know you know, what the problem is before you can solve it, right? Mm -hmm. So if you really look at the foundation of our country, the foundation is we the people. And so in order to really solve a lot of the problems that we see in our country today, you have to go to the foundation. We the people have become divided. We've become financially insecure, unstable, and we're depending on our government so much now that we're no longer independent, sovereign individuals, right? So when you look at an individual, and then you look at the family structure, strong individuals make for a strong family. Strong families make for a strong country. So we really have to get back to that biblical, the, the nuclear family, if you will say. We have to get back to strong families, a mother and a father in the household. We have to get back to strong individuals who are stable economically, who are stable mentally, who are stable in their overall physical health, spiritual health too. We, we have to bring back moral statutes and standards in our country and the education system i mean all of the above right so that's really what you have to look at is go back to the foundation that made our country great in the first place that foundation is we the people we the people are the government we're the most local form of government there is and so when you look at you know the structure of government you have the federal government you have the state government and then you have families you have we the people and so really all of our power all the government's power is derived from us, the consent of the governed, as stated in the declaration. And so that's really what we have to do. We have to strengthen we the people. We have to go back to those moral values that set us apart from all of the world when we were first founded. I completely agree. A lot of what you said there reminds me of uh, what Michael Knowles, the conservative uh, talk show host, talks about in terms of it all um it's fundamental there's a lot of fun. a phenomenal speech at i think it was cpac a couple mm -hmm. months ago and he was highlighting that and i i thought it was spot on i loved it yep yeah i i'm a big fan of michael knowles listen to his show 
a lot of the time he and Matt Walsh are both very, were both very influential uh, for me. But yeah, I think that's very interesting what you said too in terms of like going back to the family as the basic political unit. Um, I also completely agree with what you said about we are way too dependent on the federal government in terms of um, even someone like yourself or myself, I think, are way more dependent on the federal government than we even realize. People who we tend to think ourselves are pretty independent. But I think, for example, I've put out a couple YouTube shorts, not anything extensive, just a couple YouTube shorts breaking down why I think Social Security needs to end as a program and what that would entail, how you'd progressively end it over time. And the reaction to that was about what I expected. People just cannot fathom the idea of the government not being for them with some sort of cushion there, you know, It's, it's, it's become years a fundamental part of our lives, right? I, I, you're exactly right, yeah. And, and that's actually, if I can, something that I wanted to talk about with, with Gen Z is, you know, if you look at asking the question why Gen Z, why the younger generation needs to step into politics, that's probably one of the, you know, it's a big question that I hear. It's either that or how can we help, right? Once, once you uh, answer the first question. And so answering that question, really, um, you have to make politics and government personal because it really does impact our daily lives. Every single day, Gen Z, really everyone, but especially Gen Z and the younger generation, were affected by the policies in our government, the policies that are pushed. You go to the gas tank and oh, it's pretty expensive to fill up your car. You go to the grocery store, it's pretty expensive to buy groceries. You get a college degree and, well, it's kind of hard to find a job now. So I think Gen Z is beginning to see that. I'm seeing that online all the time, different videos. And we have to expose and really show the younger generation, hey, government and politics is something we not should set apart or be afraid of. We need to intertwine our personal life, our religion in that because they are intertwined and they affect one another. And so once you show that, I think Gen Z and everyone our age, a little bit older, a little bit younger, they're going to be more apt to start voting, making an educated vote, and being willing to be a part of the political process. Right. And I think one of the things that is interesting is because a lot of the the older people in uh, politics specifically, uh, and, and it's a generational thing, but they bemoan the fact the younger generation is ruining, ruining everything. Every generation says that, uh, you know, Boomers said it about uh, millennials, millennials will, or about Gen X, Gen X will say it about millennials, millennials will say it about Gen Z, Gen Z will say it about Gen Alpha, and so on and so forth. So uh, I think that's something that's going to happen regardless. But statistically speaking, uh, right now it is possible the Gen Z is the downfall of the Republic, just <laughs> putting it uh, uh, blank, uh, uh, bluntly. So I pulled up some, some data here from Pew Research, which shows... Um, Younger voters go with Democrats, older voters go with Republicans. It's not anything that should surprise anyone. Anyone who pays basic attention to politics knows this. But Gen Z and even millennials to an extent are a very stark contrast. So the biggest gains for Republicans, the older someone gets, the more likely they are to vote Republicans. So if you're over 80, Republicans have a 19-point advantage. But and that goes down to 40 through 59. You waver from a 3-point Dem to a 3-point Republican advantage. Uh, 30 through 39 is plus 13 for Dems, but then ages 18 through 29, Dems have a 32 point advantage in terms of um, uh, the people, the people that associate. Yeah, in terms of the people that associate with one party or the other, uh, about two thirds of voters ages 18 to 24, 66 percent, associate with the Democrat Party. 34 for the GOP. Um, there's a similarly large gap. I'm reading now from Pew Research. Similarly large gap in the partisan affiliation of voters. 25 to 29, which I already mentioned. Voters in their 30s also tilt, dem tilt Democrat to a lesser extent. 55 to 42, Democrat to Republican, like I said, 13 point advantage. Then the older they get, the more it uh, starts tilting more to the GOP. So it's very interesting, and I'd be interested to hear your thoughts as to why you think that is, that Gen Z tends to be so much more, first of all, radical, really, not just leaning one way or the other, but truly radical, even. I mean, we see the college campus protests on the left side, but even on the side of conservatives, we see, uh, you know, for, and a good thing in my opinion, but yourself and, and myself, we tend to be not, not the, uh, the, the party of Mitt Romney anymore. The, Mitt Romney and George Bush were kind of moving more toward the party of, of uh, Bob Good or Ron DeSantis or someone like that, 
or you know a Chip Roy or someone along those lines. So even a Trump, you, I would say, in, in some instances, in many instances. So why do you think that is that that um, younger voters tend to be not only more radical but also more radical in terms of to the left too? So there's probably a number of things that stack into why, but I would say one of the biggest things that I see is them not being educated, unfortunately. And there's different things that play into that. Uh, part of it is the college scam kind of that we see today. I'm not saying all of college is a scam. Uh, there's a lot of you know great needs for colleges, but there is a lot of propaganda and a lot of agenda pushing in the K through 12 schools all the way up to college. And that really plays a big impact on, on the younger generation. At a young age, your mind is basically the most vulnerable it ever will be. That's when you're learning all the foundational skills, things, fundamental principles, everything. So when you have a school system that is run by the government and it's teaching and pushing an agenda, having drag queens reading to young children, you know, five to 10 years old, having pornographic books that, you know, even the school board members don't even want to hear what's in it. When you have that in the libraries, when you have uh, standards that are very, very low. You have uh, students who really aren't able to take a hold and unlock their learning, their individual learning abilities. All of that plays into uneducated citizens and uneducated citizens aren't able to make a informed vote. So that's probably one of the biggest things. Um, and I think, you know, I think there's solutions to that problem. I think homeschool is a very good solution, uh, if not the best. I 100% agree. Um, we had a situation here in Campbell recently, Campbell County, which for those who don't know is here kind of getting toward the southwest part of Virginia, a very conservative place about off the top of my head, 60-40 Republican we'll say. Um, but we had a situation here where the way it works in Campbell anyway is the Board of Supervisors, which is like a town council if you will, uh, the Board of Supervisors, the governing body of the county, they're oh, not directly in control of but they're kind of over the school board who are also elected representatives of the school board. Uh, and below the school board are the library board. Now each uh, supervisor picks the representative, his representative to the library board, the library board under the school board, but it makes decisions. And recently we had uh, the library board in deeply conservative Campbell County with uh, board members from our li uh, library board members from Republican board of supervisors voting against moving uh, a sexually explicit book was found in the Campbell County Library school system, and the school board voted against moving it to a different section for whatever reason. So thankfully, um, many of our supervisors are involved with our local uh, Republican Party, our local GOP, and uh, they were get taking care of it. Um, one of our supervisors, especially Matt Klein, was right on it. Um, so that's great. They got it figured out. But it just shows that the power and the hold the left has in the at, American at the education level. system. Yeah. yeah. Even in my county, Franklin County, very conservative county, always votes, you know, for the Republican candidate, very conservative. And our school board, for the most part, is conservative. But we've had problems with, you know, removing those books from our, our own schools, too. And I think that is just a testament, and it should be a lesson for all of us, that when you remove yourselves as citizens from the local level, it's it's going to corrupt from the local level. And that's how the top gets corrupted, right? It, it doesn't go top down. It's It's bottom up. Yep. And and that's because that's where the power is. The most the the power lies with we the people, and it goes, you know, uh, your board of supervisors, school board, local county sheriff. Then you have the state, the federal government. Federal government is newsflash the least powerful form of government. It's not the most, and it derives its power from the local branches. So we have to get involved locally in order to drain the swamp because the swamp's not going to drain itself. That's the truth. Um kind of capitalizing off what you said before we move on um that's true to for example here in campbell it's interesting how often local races get overlooked so for example on campbell here in we mentioned deeply red campbell county we have a five to two democrat school board so technically uh, in in virginia the local races so anything below a state delegate race on the ballots of supervisor uh, uh city council school board, et cetera, you're not allowed to have a political affiliation next to your name on the ballot. But each 
candidate identifies as an independent or a Democrat or Republican, just like usual. But in Campbell, our school board is a five to two Democrat currently. So we're trying to change that. Um, but yeah, so the board of supervisors is conservative and everything. Library boards also Republican, and all our like our delegate Eric Zare, who I've interviewed a couple times on the show, he's great. So we're we're all set there. But the school board has gotten overlooked in the past, and it's a very hard position to win because the public schools they're going to battle to keep their own. We've seen it many many times locally how someone a good candidate who should win based on the demographics of the area ends up losing their race to someone who is more either an incumbent and or more entrenched with the school system, even though they don't, uh, that person who won doesn't align with the will of the voters, really. So it's an incredibly hard but very important things to keep in mind. So I, I know we, yeah, I know, I know we got off on that side trail there. Yep, yeah, go ahead. I just want to encourage anyone who's watching, if you are a citizen, get involved locally. Don't just vote every four years for the presidency or every two years for the midterms. You got to vote every single year. You got to make it, make an educated vote and you really have to hold your leaders accountable. My uh, uncle, and then we'll, we'll move on. I'll digress. But my, my uncle uh, has, has said we're unfortunate enough uh, to have uh, off your election to Virginia, meaning every single year in Virginia, we have an election. 2023 last year, there wasn't much. It was just state Senate House of Delegates. So not a whole lot, but the fact is not every state is like that. Most states don't have off year elections, but so most people aren't going to have something to vote for every year, but there are some even with local races. So you got to be involved and informed and getting on your local GOP is a great way to do that. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Pay attention to the runoffs. Yep. Yep. Virginia doesn't have runoffs, but a lot of states do to your point. Like Georgia, you saw Georgia last year, for example, or a couple years ago with Herschel Walker and Raphael Warnock. But, uh, sticking with our um, topic at hand about Gen Z involved in politics. So you mentioned that that one of the reasons, uh, one of the many reasons Gen Z voters are vote to the left is because they're uninformed. What needs to be done from people like you and me, and even people older than us, but specifically speaking to our generation, what needs to be done to reach other people like us to inform them and then also not just inform them about their candidates, but kind of convince them why voting for Tim Walls and Kamala Harris, Mr. Socialism is neighborly. You know, why, why is that a and why is that a bad thing? So, how do we reach those people and then convince them? What needs to be done in that regard? It's definitely tough, right? And I think part of that is getting out of our comfort zone. Uh, we have to do that. Um, I'm actually wearing a shirt right now. Fear is not a virtue, right? So don't let your fear control you. You need to get out of the box that fear tries to entrap you in and go meet other people. Go to college campuses. There are that's that's the central hub for young people. And actually, if I you know I were uh, part of Trump's team advising him on campaigning, I would say go to every single college campus you can and hold a rally. Every single one you can. JD Vance had a rally at Radford University on the campus. I was actually there, it was two weeks ago. Uh, great support. There were so many people there. Uh, the building was full and there were people outside you know, trying to get in. So we have to go to Gen Z. We have to start getting online. Stuff like this right here. Go to TikTok, go to YouTube, go to Instagram. We have to go to where they are and we have to get our message across. And when we give our message, like I said earlier, we really have to make the message apply. So many times as conservatives, we're trying to get the policy across and really honing in on the, you know, the specifics on the policy and defining all that and, you know, getting really into the nitty gritty. And we forget to explain why it's important. You know, why, why is it important to shut the border down? You know, why is it important to uh, stop funding foreign wars in other countries? Uh, why, why is inflation out of control and what can we do to stop it? You know, so there's certain questions and as conservatives, especially when we're explaining the policies and our solutions, we have to explain why it's going to help the citizens, help Gen Z, why it matters, why it's important, because it will. It will help them. It will affect them. And we have to get that point across. The Yeah, the fact is, for a long time, I think that the GOP has just been kind of fearing that, you know, well, kind of dreading the fact Gen Z is going to be involved at some point. Let's just hope we can get things turned around before that. The fact is the time is over. The GOP can ignore Gen Z and millennials. They're a huge part of the voting block now. And so they're going to have to start reaching them on issues that matter to them. And the, the fact is a 
a 20 year old is going to be a lot more easy to sway in his political opinions than a 60 year old. A 60 year old is probably not going to change his political opinions. Most 20 year olds don't have any idea about anything related to politics or economics. So if you have that knowledge and, just, and explain to them why the policies of the current administration are making them pay three and a half dollars at the pump per gallon or, or, or uh, you know, even driving up their student loan costs. They're, um, I mean, inflation, interest rates, why they're stuck in debt. There's all sorts of stuff to come back to. So, for example, the, the, the way Gen Z, as an example of the way Gen Z doesn't have any idea what they're doing, to be honest, in politics. This is an article from NPR. It says, for 19-year-old Jenna Ruiz, voting for the first time was a thrill. Uh, she was one of the millions of young Americans newly eligible to vote in the 2022 midterms. That excitement didn't smooth over some of the uncertainty Ruiz experienced when it came time to actually cast her ballots. I felt, I'm not going to lie, a little bit lost in some of the things that were on the ballot, Ruiz told NPR. She said she was mostly motivated to vote because she disagreed with the conservative social policies of Florida's current Republican governor, Ron DeSantis, who ended up winning re-election. I do identify more towards the Democrat Party, but I still felt like I didn't really know everything that was on the ballot, Ruiz added. I was just excited to vote. And that's just... It seems like it so embodies the spirit of our generation that it's... I've, po I've pointed out I don't have any hard data to back this up, but to me it seems our generation is one of the least willing to identify with a specific specific political party. The, the left, le the crazy kids on the college campus, they don't want to be called uh, associated with the Democrat Party necessarily because the Democrat Party, historically, the old historical Democrats still support Israel. And for the cons young conservatives, they don't really want to be associated with the GOP because it is such a mess. It's such an establishment mess for the most part. So I think that's an interesting fact because um, it shows that they're, they, they do want to get involved. Gen Z, a lot of them do. They want change, but they don't have the first idea how to do it. So you mentioned... Yeah, they go have ahead, responsibility, go ahead. and they're not quite sure what to do with the responsibility yet. And that's because our side hasn't done a great job at reaching over and informing them on how to, you know, take about the duties of being a, a biblical and constitutional citizen. So I think our side needs to do a better job of that. And, and we can, you know, you and me, any young conservative can. We just got to reach over, start asking them questions, be nice about it, be kind, be compassionate, uh, share our views and, you know, then inform them in any way that we can. I know one of the things you are a big fan of, um, big, going back to what you said about educating them on what it takes to be a constitutional American, um, going back to what you said, I know you're a big fan of Rick Green's Patri uh, Patriot Academy. So I know you've been to that a couple of times. Give me a little bit of information about that for the voters, or for the listeners, excuse me. Yeah, so uh, I'm glad actually that you brought that up. So Patriot Academy is a conference for 16 to 25 year olds. They hold them in seven different states, but the main one is in Texas. So what you're going to do is act like the legislature for three to four days or even a week if you go to the national in Texas. So it's probably one of the most realistic mock uh, legislation simulations in the country. They teach you through a biblical perspective. So you're going to get that constitutional teaching. You're going to get the biblical perspective. Uh, Rick Green is the founder. He ran uh, and served as a state delegate in Texas. Uh, in the late 90s, early 2000s. Patriot Academy has been around since 2003. I have attended three leadership conferences, but I really encourage you, if, if you're a young person, and even if you're not you know, super involved in politics or super interested, you're going to learn so much from this experience. You're going to learn skills on public speaking, leadership. You're going to meet so many young patriots who you know, are young and they're trying to figure out you know, what to do in life, and, and they have so much passion. And they're they're kind of asking the questions of what can I do to, to help my country. So, yeah, I encourage you to go look that up. Patriot Academy, uh, patriotacademy.com. Uh, look them up on YouTube, just anywhere. And uh, Rick Green, those are the two things you need to know. Very good. And if I can remember here, we will link that uh, Patriot Academy's website in the show notes for those to, to, uh, to go check it out. I'm very interested in it as well. Hope to attend at some point. So we are running out of time here. We've got about eight minutes left, so I'm going to speed it up here a little bit. Um, it's interesting, too, breaking down the Gen Z demographic further. I mentioned how a lot of Gen Z is not only uh, sharply divided far left and far right. 
that divide is actually split very consistently down uh, women and men, Gen Z women and men. So interestingly, uh, historically, young people are the Democrats' huge voting block, and they get more conservative as they get older. Now, that's actually changing a little bit, and it, the interesting thing is when you first read the story, the women uh, – this is a story here from The Guardian – the women – uh, of Gen of Gen Z are getting further and further radically left and more politically involved than Gen Z men who are actually trending further right. So young people, and at first it sounds like well that's not great if the if the women are more politically involved and moving further to the left, but the fact that anyone in Gen Z is at all going to the right and a large portion of them are a large portion of the men are going to the right is actually a win in my mind and we're seeing that. And there's all sorts of theories as to why that's happening. Matt Walsh has posed several different interesting theories as to why that's happened. But um, I want to just read you a little bit of this data here. Uh, the, the partisan gap between young men and women almost doubled in the past 25 years. Again, this is from The Guardian. Um, the study from Melissa Deckman has found that Gen Z men are becoming more conservative as well as increasingly indifferent to politics, bucking long-standing trends dating back to the 70s. That tell young people across the board voting liberal and men generally being more involved in politics than women. Meanwhile, Gen Z women have not only become the most progressive cohort in U.S. history, but are also expected to outpace their male peers across virtually every measure of political involvement. And so donating money, volunteering for campaigns, etc., etc. And it is a 23-point gap again between uh, men vote, it looks to me, if I'm reading this data correctly, about 12 points conservatively. Women vote about... Let me see here. That's about, I believe, 23 points, or that could be 13. Sorry, I'm looking at this data wrong. The point being, I'm not going to cite the wrong numbers here, but the point being, there's a dramatic difference in the way young men and young women vote. So I've seen this a little bit in my own life in terms of the women, women starting to get involved more in politics, it seems to me. Although, again, I'm very much in a conservative area, so I don't see quite the same thing. I'm interested to hear your thoughts on it. Why do you think this is? So. Uh, the difference between, yeah, male and female, um, you know, I would say it's partially conservative messaging, but then also the policies that are pushed by the left that applies more towards women, especially when you look at uh, abortion and, as they would say, women's rights. So that that's a thing on the messaging that I'm talking about. We have to, the left has really redefined so much. They've twisted truth. They've They've redefined everything to make it sound personable, make it sound, quite frankly, a lot different than it really is yeah. at uh, the issue at heart. So, I think uh, the major dif- the major the major difference is uh, our messaging and what what that applies to women and men. Yeah, I th- I like that you mentioned the fact about abortion. Recently, I've actually been working on some various ads attacking. Tim Waltz for his stance on abortion. We've got about four minutes here left, so I'm going to wrap it up. But we've the conservatives have completely ceded the ground to the left on abortion. Not conservative grassroots, but the GOP as a whole has completely ceded the ground to the left. They've accepted the media messaging of all things that conservatives, Republicans cannot win on the topic of abortion. And that goes to your ties into your point of our messaging on it. If the GOP would, would work on changing their messaging from well, we just want a reasonable 15 week ban. We're not quite sure why, because that's not when life starts, but life is viable inside the womb. But maybe that's not really when life starts. We have no idea what we're talking about. And it doesn't work, which is why it hasn't worked. If we go to if we stick to our guns and stick to the 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 principle, the fact that life begins at conception and attack the Democrats for the brutality that is abortion, Choice 42, that newer organization headed up, I think, by Laura Kloss and does a, has run some great commercials as to uh, the brutality of abortion. And I'm trying to work on those ads as well. Several several ads I'm getting up now are out on the channel and being run across the swing states. So I completely agree with your messaging that, that conservative messaging must increase and that's why, uh, must change and increase. And that's why we're seeing the young women who are on TikTok, TikTok and Snapchat and everywhere else getting almost exclusively this pro-abortion messaging. And it sounds great and all. It's just women's health care or whatever. So as yeah, we're as conservatives, go ahead, we got we to take back the terms that the left has stolen from us. They've twisted truth. So we have to take back those terms. We have to take back truth. And then we have to define what we're talking about. And th- I think that really goes back to 
re-educating, like we were talking about earlier, we have to educate and explain our position and explain really what the left is for. We can't dance around the issue. We can't, you know, we got to come out. We got to be straightforward and we got to explain, hey, here's really what abortion is. Here's really what it isn't, it, what it isn't. Uh, and, you know, basically explain where the left has twisted things and try to make things as clear as possible for the voters. So as we we're almost done here, but I just want to mention, so I'm about to film an episode about Tim Walz, which will actually be released before the episode we're recording now. So that brought it to mind. You can go check it out. It's out on the channel by the time you're watching this. But for you, Elijah, what do you think off the top of your head? What are the first couple reasons why you encourage people to, as far as this election goes, vote for the Trump Vance ticket as opposed to the Harris Waltz ticket, Walls ticket, I should say. And this can be a positive or a negative, like your vote vote for Trump because or don't vote for Harris because blank. So what are your first couple reasons that come to the top of your head in about sixty seconds? So for the last four years, we've seen an administration, if you want to call it that, of incompetence, of weakness. And I think it's really time to restore weakness, to restore uh, truth to to the White House. So if you look at the policies, uh, Trump and Vance are very strong on many things, including including the border, which is probably the biggest problem we face in our country right now. Inflation. There's so many different issues. And I encourage you to you know look at both sides, see which one is more genuine, see which one actually cares about you and your family and the economy and this country overall more. And I think you'll, you'll make the right decision. I completely agree. Well, Elijah, thank you so much for coming on the show. It has been an absolute pleasure to have you. I hope we can do it again. Um, yes, thank you so, so much. If you have any parting words for the viewers, uh, any encouragement for them, or uh, any more messages for them before we let you go. I would just say um, don't be afraid of politics. Don't, it can be dirty, but separate it from government. Okay, we need good government is good. It's not always bad. God instituted government. Get involved. Make educated votes. And, um, you know, don't stop fighting. Don't let your fear um, overcome you, overcome the fear. Yes, sir. Completely agree. Thank you so much, Elijah. Appreciate it. In the words of our great president, look here, Jack. I'll challenge you to push-ups, but that's neither here nor there. Don't forget to subscribe to the Fight and Revive YouTube channel and help us reach more people with our conservative message.